And so uh, next up, we're going to uh, switch a little bit to um, treaty waters, and we're going to hear from Jason Smith, uh, fisheries assessment biologist from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, and his uh, colleague, Kevin Donner, from the uh, Great Lakes Fishery Program Manager from Little Traverse Bay Bands of Ottawa Indians. And they're going to talk to us a little bit more about whitefish. And so I'll give it to you guys. Go ahead, Kevin and Jason. Thank you. Well, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for the introduction. Um, and I, I believe uh, Jason probably going to take this away, at least to start here. Yep. So, so anytime I do these, I, I start to feel these threads. Um, and, and so the threads that, I've, that, I, that I noticed today are, are, are people that taught me like Mike Jones and then and some fishers who have taught me. And so, so by training, maybe I'm a fish populations person, but, but, but by my nature, I'm a storyteller. So I'm going to start with this quick story and then, and then we'll get into this thing that we came to talk about. So I first met Bob King on his dock. I was talking to his son and Jason Frazier and maybe one other fisher. And I was asking a bunch of questions and Bob King came down and he said, you know, who are you? What are you doing here? And I explained who I was. I actually was working for Kevin at that time and working for the little Traverse Bay bands. And he said, well, I know you're not a fish biologist because you're asking us questions. And I, you know, that made a huge impact. And, and so since then I've been thinking how, how do we do this together? And so then, then one of my mentors, Mike Jones, comes on this morning and he talks about doing this together. So, so it's been really challenging to work on whitefish and lake trout regulations and models together formally. My plea for today is until we can figure out how to do it formally, the biologists and the fishers should be working together informally as often as possible. I'm always open to that for, for people, fishers, people associated with fishing in any way, shape or form. You know, I think that's really where our work needs to be. And, and so that's my plea for today. And I'm hoping that that thread will kind of weave throughout this, this presentation. I guess now we can start and look at, you know, you know, the actual presentation. Next slide, please. So here, we're pretty aware of this, right? Lake whitefish, especially in the upper lakes in our area, is not so great. Harvest is way down. The, the light gray bar is the upper lakes all harvest. The, the black bar is, is seeded water cora harvest. They follow in a really remarkably similar shape. And the, and the reason that I put this up here is, is really this to me is the stage setter. So, so harvest of whitefish has been cyclical you know, for 140 years. Right now we're all super concerned. Are we going into a bad time or is this just another cycle? And for me, the thing to be always thinking about is are conditions such that whitefish can make a return as they have in the past? Or, or can we help it be such that conditions are right for these fish to make another comeback? So, so I don't think it's all gloom and doom. Whitefish have gone up and down in the past, but we need to be making pretty certain that we do the things that make that possible for this next resurgence. Next slide, please. So again, Mike Jones set the stage. He talked about recruitment. Um, in this particular case, this is modeled recruitment. This is what the models tell us is going on. So on the x-axis is the year. On the y-axis is, is an index of age three fish as, as projected by the models. The red box is, is really critical because because of model structure, these last three years are not well informed by any data. Actually, they're not informed by any data. And the model structure always causes us to have a rosy picture of recruitment in recent years. As this model goes on, I can almost guarantee you that those last three data points will be down close to the data point preceding that. Um, and so basically the idea is young fish are not showing up in the fishery. 
Um, and so that, that really kind of is the whole point of today's talk. Why? Why aren't young fish showing up in this fishery? All right. Um, you know, we're kind of going back and forth here, so I'll jump in and, and handle a couple of these slides. So I, I, I definitely tackle what Jason just said. Uh, we're definitely interested in what is potentially causing these declines. Is it natural? Is it unnatural? What's happening? Uh, in that process, though, you know, sometimes our science scientific process, really what we're trying to do is is also cross a couple possibilities off the list and not just deal with the ones that could be causing it, but what, what may not be causing it. Um, you know, Jason has spoken to many fishermen and, and biologists and other folks and, and myself as well. And, and we've heard a lot of feedback, uh, particularly about lake trout predation. Um, and, you know, it kind of makes sense, right? Lake trouts are a predator, uh, lake trouts are predator. They, they've increased in abundance, uh, maybe they have been uh, contributing to this decline in whitefish. Um, and though it's still possible that this is happening in certain localities, and certainly you can find lake trout that are full of whitefish, uh, we don't think that this is probably a likely driver of these changes overall, like not, not the big gorilla in the room, so to speak. Um, and we just have a couple, we can point to a couple examples of why that's probably the case. In Lake Michigan, for example, um, we saw whitefish recruitment start to decline kind of in the early to mid 2000s. Um, and lake trout populations at that time were actually pretty low. So it just doesn't really make logical sense that the lake trout at that time, having a low population, would have started to cause a decline in whitefish. Uh, we saw their populations increase four to five years after that started to occur. We also look at diets, and, and we've certainly stumbled, as I mentioned, across uh, lake trout diets that are chock full of whitefish, uh, and sometimes more than one lake trout full of them. But on the average, when we look throughout the year, uh, spring, summer, fall, winter, and, and we're now analyzing hundreds and occasionally thousands of lake trout stomachs a year, um, we're seeing that by and large, usually less than 3% of that diet is whitefish. So that's not to say that it's not important in certain times and in certain places, but overall, it seems like that's not a huge proportion of their diet. They're primarily eating round goby and alewife and occasionally smelt. Um, but you know, a, a small percentage, uh, composition of the diet is, doesn't necessarily mean it's not a problem. We can take that information. We can plug it into our modeling process. We can determine what the entire population of lake trout is eating in terms of whitefish on an annual basis, and then compare that to what the whitefish populations are producing. And even when we do that and take a look at that, and I, I don't have any official results to share, but you know, overall, in most places, they're just not going to have the impact that you would expect with that kind of, uh, you know, with them being a major contributor to whitefish recruitment decline. That said, there are a few places in some of the lakes where lake trout abundance is really high and whitefish abundance is really low, even compared to other places. And it's possible that maybe those lake trout are now playing a role more of a role than they have in the past in those places, but it's not like they, they brought that population to that place where now they can, you know, now they might play a role. So, you know, we're looking at this more, we're not done analyzing lake trout as a possibility, but uh, so far it seems like we can at least cross this off of the list of, of the big pieces of the pie that might be contributing to this issue. You know, the other thing we hear a lot, and this is not something we typically hear from fishers, at least not too much, is, you know, is overfishing causing this decline? Um, maybe we hear it from, from fishers who are wondering about other fishers, but, uh, but most of this comes from, you know, state officials and federal officials. And um, just to be frank about it, uh, the way our whitefish populations look uh, right now is not how they would look if we were seeing substantial amounts of overfishing. We see a lot of populations that have a lot of older fish. These are 12, 13, 14, sometimes even 20 years old. And in populations where you're seeing aggressive harvest rates, those fish would, they'd never make it to that age. They'd be harvested out uh, earlier on. Uh, we also, uh, the, the models, we estimate the mortality of the population. We understand 
what you know bad or aggressive mortality looks like for whitefish relative to like not so bad or low mortality and by and large in almost all cases we see pretty low mortality specific overall period and then also specifically with regard to harvest because we sort that out by natural mortality harvest mortality sometimes sea lamprey mortality you know another thing uh that we look at too is the end of the day if okay let's say over harvest is occurring such that it's actually reducing the ability of that population to reproduce and that's causing that recruitment decline but we also see places where larval abundance, we, we're doing this now a lot more, we're measuring the number of larvae in the water and we're comparing that to historical estimates. We're not seeing that kind of reduction that you would expect if you know there weren't enough eggs produced to produce enough larvae. So there's just a, once again, overfishing, it's possible that in certain places it's contributing, but it doesn't seem to be the big uh, gorilla in the room when it comes to recruitment. Next slide, please. So that leads us to, you know, what might be doing this? What might be causing these declines? And, you know, we have some pretty strong hypotheses. Uh, there's some, some very uh, coincidental uh, dracinid muscles. Everybody talks about dracinid muscles and I talk about whitefish recruitment. Um, but at the end of the day, we really feel still that there's important aspects to hammer out here, uh, research to be done in the hopes that we can find maybe some tips or clues or, or some way to more effectively or efficiently kind of address this stuff or, or determine the best approach. Um, and, and so we're looking at all these different uh, aspects with early life history, studying the fish themselves, what they eat, uh, what their food is you know, produced by. Uh, we're looking at how that might be, uh, what that looks like in the context of a changing ecosystem and 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 really just trying to understand how that might relate to some of these major shifts that have occurred especially as mussels have come into this lake and other uh, invasives through time next next uh slide um and then you know just to touch on a few of those the, the early life history piece i mean um really it's been about the last god 2013, 2014, uh, more and more groups ever since that time have been jumping into this fray and starting to look at this stuff. And it's become highly collaborative. I mean, I, I would say it's still uh, a major part of this work is being led by the tribes, pushed by the tribes, coordinated by the tribes, core tribes, at least in the ceded territory for in, in particular. But we're really trying to uh, almost like a kitchen sink approach. Uh, we're trying to find these fish where they're at at those early life stages, you know, when they're less than six months old, primarily. Uh, we're trying to figure out what what other species are inhabiting those areas. Maybe there's a predation problem at a really small stage. Maybe they're starving to death. We're looking at what's called bomb calorimetry, calorimetry which is kind of like, uh, I mean, it's the same thing that uh, food industry uses to determine how many calories in our hamburger. Well, you can do the same thing for a whitefish, um, and if they have a, lot, a fairly low calorie density, you know, maybe that suggests that they're starving to death. They're not getting enough food. If they have high calorie density, maybe they're doing better. Uh, we're, we're not just, you know, a lot of fisheries work happens nine to five during the daytime. Uh, that's not our style. Uh, Jason and I both uh, have spent many late nights uh, dealing with that kind of question, and we, we make our folks do that too. Um, and so we're doing nighttime, dial, night versus day, near shore versus our offshore. You know, we really want to understand these fish. And, then, and it's even gotten to a point now where we're, we're coordinating, collaborating with universities, uh, Central Michigan University, uh, LSSU, trying to look at competition and feeding uh, and, and doing this in like small scale, what they call mesocosm experiments, where we have these tanks and we set up food densities at a certain level. We put predators in or prey in or competitors in with the whitefish and then we just kind of see how they do and it kind of helps us control the environment next slide please Kevin, there's actually a question here um yeah. hannah's wondering if there's any e-dna sampling included in this array of approaches yeah um it, it hasn't really happened much yet um but uh jason has actually can talk to it uh, that, that a little bit later uh, with some of the river work that's being done. Um, you know, eDNA is 
I think there was a time maybe five years ago where everybody thought it was the silver bullet that was going to solve all of our problems and tell us where all the fish are and how many and, and all those things. And the, certainly since then, we've learned that it's it's got some flaws. Uh, it's not a perfect tool, um, but also the techniques have gotten better. And so it is being used to some extent to figure out kind of where these fish are at, particularly in rivers and how many and, and what their populations are. But I think we'll see more of that in the future uh, as opposed to now, which is, just isn't that much. Um, one quick thing, Kevin. So, so thinking about using eDNA in that beach area, we, we had originally maybe been informed that these, that these larval fish were fairly near known spawning grounds, but Sioux Tribe started a new a new protocol last year where we actually picked random locations within the seeded waters. Um, and the only place that we didn't catch larval lake whitefish on the beach was directly adjacent to the spawning shoals in Whitefish Bay in Lake Superior. Every other place, places where no one expected us to catch them. So, so I think the eDNA approach, I think if we could get the signal, what we would find is that if you have a beach, you'll have an eDNA signal from these small fish. That makes sense. So getting back to the slide here, um, I, you know, one of the, one of our, I guess, earliest efforts to kind of orient towards this question was this beach sanding survey that I, I've, I think I've talked about to this group before, but essentially, you know, we, we realized that in midsummer, you know, we could potentially catch these animals, uh, study them, understand what they're dealing with, uh, measure them on an annual basis using very simple tools and a minimal amount of uh, resource effort. And so we kind of cobbled together a, a, a swarthy team of uh, initially it was uh, Little Traverse, Michigan Department of Natural Resources and Sioux Tribe in 2013. You know, I think we went out and hit maybe 19 sites with these sains. We caught whitefish. Since then, this, this effort has grown to, I would say, at least 13 participants, uh, 60 or 70 sites in Lakes, Michigan, Huron, and Superior, inside the Ceded Territory, outside of it, uh, even in Canada. Uh, these folks did at least for a few years. <clears throat> what we're hoping for is some sort of index through time. Uh, right now, what what our models do are tell us what recruitment was in the past after those fish enter our fishery. Uh, the intent here was, uh, well, I want to know what's going to happen two to three, four years from now. So our intent here was to um, start to understand a little bit better what the uh, recruitment rates were and predict that. Um, and we've gotten some interesting results. Uh, if you could click one more time, you know, by and large, we've seen fairly uh, kind of consistent numbers of fish in these seining efforts. However, in the 2015 year class, we did, or in 2015, we did notice that across Lakes Hish, uh, Michigan and Huron, we got higher catch rates across the board. And we saw that in the seining survey, we saw that in other surveys. So the big question now is, are those fish going to enter the commercial fishery? Is this something that actually could help us predict the future? And we have had some preliminary indications that some of these fish are just now starting to enter the fishery. So it's possible we have a pretty useful index here. Next slide. <coughs> um, as part of that survey and other surveys, uh, I mentioned we're really looking at this food limitation possibility. So there hasn't been a lot of zooplankton work that's occurred in really near shore areas, but there's been pretty consistent zooplankton work occurring offshore. Uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration has been sampling out of Muskegon, kind of one site every year for a long time now. And what they noticed is immediately after descended mussels really took hold, the uh, quaggas in particular took hold in Lake Michigan, they saw this major decline in um, zooplankton abundance uh, following that. And we believe that's linked to whitefish decline, alewife decline, salmon decline, everything. So we're trying to take the same approach, monitor these animals, but in the near shore area where the whitefish may be relying on them most. Uh, and, and I think we're beginning to get some results in that regard. Uh, if you could head to the next slide where we're actually, I mean, not many people look in the guts of a <laughs> two inch whitefish, but it turns out that they do eat very specific things. Uh, if you look at these uh, kind of 
bar graphs here kind of zoom in on Lake Whitefish, uh, which is the LWF in the middle. We have 2015 in the top panel, 2017 in the bottom panel, two different years, same species. What we found is that they really rely on uh, copepods. The, the green and the blue uh, on these bars is both uh, kind of copa, uh, a copepod consumption, and they really seem to key into that stuff. They also eat other things like coronamids and some other types of zooplankton. When you compare that to what's available, so that last bar, there are copepods available. We, this is where we take our own net, not just look at the guts of these whitefish. We take our own net. And we do find those copepods, but we determined that uh, the composition of what's available, they're not necessarily the most abundant thing every single year. Some years we have uh, that gray bar represents uh, nauplii and, and copepodites. So these are really, really small organisms that the whitefish just either can't see or can't handle or aren't interested in, or perhaps they're just completely unedible or unpalatable. So there's a lot of stuff out there that they're not accessing that they could. And the other thing we found is that those copepods, and I didn't really put it in here, but they're in incredibly low densities in these near shore areas relative to what we think most whitefish like when it comes to surviving and, and thriving well. So, you know, there's more to come on this. This is preliminary information. And now we're again, collaboratively working Jason and I, as well as, uh, Grand Traverse Band, uh, CMU, Little River Band, all the tribes, lots of universities, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, even MDNR, uh, all coming together on this one, trying to make this thing work. So, uh, but it's it, it could help us get some of those clues as to what to do in the future. Next slide. And it's back to Jay. So what the heck are we gonna do, you know? And, and, and here, what I typically hear is folks saying there's not much we can do. And I just, I just am never going to accept that solution. I agree that the, the will might not be around at this moment, but I just, I am unwilling to accept that we cannot do stuff. So, so are there smart ways that we could increase zooplankton? Are there, are there effective ways to remove dry synod mussels? And, and could we find an effective stocking strategy, not just trying to plant millions or billions in the middle of the lake, but are there some, are there some smart solutions? Next, please. So the Invasive Muscle Collaborative has been working out of Good Harbor, trying to figure out, you know, some, some ways to remove dry synods. They have used like the most basic of methods, scrape the rocks clean with, with divers, and they've used some toxicants like Zequinox. Um, interestingly, both work pretty well and recolonization is pretty daggone slow. So once you clean off this important area, this typically spawning area for Lake Whitefish, the mussels don't come back nearly as quickly as we might think they would. So, so again, here's a, a case of where we have often thought there's no answer fight for dry synods, but maybe there actually is an answer if we have the will to do so. Next, please. Yep, and back to me, yeah. And, and with regard to the culture, uh, that's something that both Little Traverse Bay Bands and Sioux Tribe are working on. So just to briefly cover what we're dealing with, uh, we've been stocking whitefish in Cisco since about 2014 now, but we've really focused on whitefish in earnest on uh, the last few years. Uh, we had a, a stocking plan in place in 2018 and 19 that was kind of like experimental, uh, stocked about 40,000 a year. Um, in 2020, we uh, put a stocking plan forward uh, for half a million a year. This is all for Little Traverse Bay at this time. Um, and, uh, you know, we were ramping up our production. So we had about 125,000 in that year. We're going to continue this in the future. Unfortunately, this year, our egg collection efforts uh though we got plenty of eggs, the fertilization was really poor. So I'm not sure 2021 is going to be the best, uh, hmm. most calorie year for us, but uh, moving forward, we fully expect to go on. And uh, we're, we even have efforts to, to hopefully ramp this up even as, as much as a million to have multiple stocking locations. Um, but this isn't just to put fish in the water. If you could move to the next slide. Um, I'm sorry, before I hit that point, this is the uh, facility we have up north. Uh, it's 
pretty jam packed at this point, but we have a circulation system that allows us to reuse our water. We're a little water limited, uh, but that reuse allows us to raise a million uh, summer. These are two and a half inch fish or, or, or maybe even more than a million fish a year. So you're all welcome to drop by. You just need to maybe get an appointment ahead of time because we're pretty short staffed and uh, we need folks to open the door for you. Anyway, next slide. We don't want to just put these fish in the water and forget about them. We want to learn. We want to make sure this is actually effective uh, and, and understand why it, it is or is not working, depending on the outcome. So uh, once these fish are let go, uh, we go at it. We, we, we set out and, and try to recapture them with seines, trawls, gill nets, impoundment nets. Uh, we're monitoring the zooplankton that they're going to be relying on once they're stocked. We're trying to sample invertebrates that they should be relying on pretty shortly after they're stocked. And also just collecting nutrient samples. This is all funded research that we're working on right now. Um, and the hope is that if it's successful, we have some information about why. And if it's not successful, we have some information there too. We've had some success in recapturing these fish. Unfortunately, our big kickoff year for pulling all this pulling out all the stops and doing all this work was last year and i don't think anybody got all their uh, goals accomplished yeah. last year so but that's where we're at we really want to learn about this and, and provide information so that we can determine if it's viable or not uh our size for stocking is approximately two and a half inches of length uh, the intent there is to get them just past the zooplankton uh, feeding stage to a point where they can start to rely on benthic invertebrates and that should give us some information about what actually is causing this problem out in the lake. And the fish are marked before stocking. Yes. Oh, the oxytetracycline uh, chemical mark. Mm -hmm. And then you can cycle through the slide and, and then I think it's Jason's turn. There's a bunch of pictures that'll pop yep. up. Yeah, that's about the size of the fish that gets stocked. So at least in our neck of the woods, Little Travers has led the way in Corrigonid culture. Um, Sioux Tribe has, uh, has, has been a, a big producer of walleye, but in, in recent years, we have entered into this and, and taken a lot of our lessons from the folks at Little Travers. And, and I wanted to think of where could we go, where do we have facilities to go that, that most other folks don't? And, and I was really lucky, Rusty Akins, our hatchery manager, agreed to, uh, to loan me one of his walleye ponds and, and we grew whitefish in the Odening Pond last year. Um, and it, I will admit it was spur of the moment. It was not as rigorous a science as I would have liked it to have been, like it will be in 2021. But we successfully raised fish in this pond. They had amazing growth. You can see that that fish is in, this is about June 15th, that fish is over four inches long that's in that picture. They're really beautiful fish, no obvious deformities and corrigonid culture in round tanks is often fraught with deformed fish. And the day that we netted these fish out, the coolest water temperature I could find in this pond was 76. And I found a one inch band of water that had oxygen, literally a one inch band in the entire pond that had any DO that was not zero. So we've been under this idea that these fish were super fragile and required these incredibly complex and narrow parameters. I'm, I'm not so sure that they do. So, so pond culture is a way that we could, could really ramp up culture efforts. Next slide, please. So this year, we're trying all sorts of new stuff. I know time is getting close, so I will rapidly go through these. Um, if we're gonna ramp this up, we can't be babysitting each of these individual fish like we often do in a hatchery situation. So right now, we have fish incubating back in that, or we have eggs incubating back in that same Odening pond. I'm hoping that it's a case where we can actually put fertilized eggs in a hatchery pond and get something out the other end. We're using these AstroTurf type mats, which are pictured on the left. 
You spread fertilized eggs in the AstroTurf mat. We put them at the bottom of the pond. And you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have, we'll have hatchlings when the ice is gone. Next slide, please. So quickly, bright spots, Green Bay. This, and so this figure is, is commercial harvest in Green Bay. It doesn't look that great, right? It's not as good as, you know, the 1990s. Next slide, please. But if we just look at Southern Green Bay, we see that they're near their high point. The recreational fishery is going gangbusters. Commercial fishery is catching lots of fish. So something's happening good in, in Southern Green Bay. What might that be? Next slide, please. My belief is that river spawning whitefish, river spawning lake whitefish are a big part of what's important in Southern Green Bay. We have a project that we've been looking extensively at this really throughout the seeded waters and partners in, in Wisconsin. What we find is river spawning whitefish in Green Bay. What we don't find is river spawning whitefish outside of Green Bay. Um, and even kind of a gradient from lots and lots in Southern Green Bay to very few in places like the Escanaba River. Um, but I think this is a place that, that, that Corrigonid culture, Corrigonid restoration really needs to be thinking about. Could these rivers be the way to have two life history strategies in the Great Lakes so that there are fish for all of us? Next slide. So, so, so that's kind of a, a place that we're moving now is, is, to, is to stocking in river whitefish. We will be experimentally stocking river whitefish in 2022 if all things go as planned. And again, like Kevin said, we're, we're going to have very robust evaluation of this. It's not just we're going to put fish in and, and wonder what the hell happened. We're gonna put fish in and we're gonna follow these fish throughout time. And we're gonna to try to find effective ways for fish culture to, to, to be something to help these Great Lakes. Next slide. This is just a quick picture of, of one of the ways that these are called Jordan Scotty fish incubators. Next slide. You fill them with eggs, they're like little Lego blocks. You fill them with fertilized eggs, they get put in the river. Hopefully these fish imprint and come back and spawn here in another year or four. Next slide. Had to go a little fast there at the end, but we came close. <laughs> <laughs> now you guys did a great job. Thank you so much. Uh, we answered the questions during the presentation and I will connect you with Hannah after the conference. And so um, thank you again, really appreciate it. Thank you. A lot of good information.